Rudolf Steiner, very, very, very important man, theosophically trained, Rosicrucian, uh, but a great spiritual innovator himself, homeopath, um, was initiated in 1907 as a Rosicrucian. He headed the German theosophical groups. He broke away from Besant and Leadbeater when they declared Krishnamurti to be the new messiah. And he founded Anthroposophy. And he developed Blavatsky's cosmology into much more than, uh, the, than she herself had just written in. And there's a whole lot of tremendous metaphysics associated with this. Um, and uh, he lectured more than he wrote. A lot of people took down what he said. And he built a thing uh, based on Goethe, called the Goetheanum. <laughs> it was a, a, a big house, and he wrote mystery plays and things like this, and it was a place where uh, anthroposophy and uh, esoteric things were studied and performed and carried out. Uh, and it looked like this. This was burned to the ground by fascists' opponents. Hitler hated this guy. Uh, on New Year's Eve of 1922 and 23. Uh, he tried to use Steiner's homeopathic rabbit sterilization to stop the Jews from breeding. Uh, he was a great admirer of Steiner, but he hated him because Steiner hated the fascists. But literally, he, the Steiner's method, uh, when he was, there was a horrible uh, plague of rabbits in a European country, he took the sperm from the male rabbits and he made a homeopathic uh, spray out of it and he sprayed all the borders and then the rabbits start, stopped reproducing and got rid of the plague of rabbits. So Hitler took the sperm of a bunch of captured Jews in his camps <laughs> and ground it up and sprayed it all over Europe hoping to stop the Jews from breeding. Uh, yes. <coughs> Probably the greatest legacies of uh, Steiner are the uh, Waldorf schools that are still very active and alive, and biodynamic agriculture, uh, which has uh, led into a lot of modern practices in organic farming and so on. So today there's a very vibrant anthroposophic movement in the U.S. and worldwide. Paul Foster Case was a member of the Golden Dawn who was demented uh, because he, uh, well, I'm going to go through the whole issue of it, but he established what was called BOTA, uh, which is called the Builders of the Adytum. The Adytum is a sanctuary in Los Angeles and started teaching people metaphysical and esoteric things. He was succeeded uh, by Ann Davies uh, after his death. And many modern Rosicrucians and also uh, Golden Donners and so on uh, hold him in great reverence and use his books uh, quite a bit. Uh, God form magic that was based on the Egyptian gods became a major kind of thing, especially in the British. Uh, the Servants of Light which were established by W.E.B. Butler and uh, Dolores Ashcroft Mawicki. Uh, became a, a very important esoteric teaching school in England, and there were also some here. I've talked to Dolores uh, about 15 years ago, a long time on the phone a couple of times, about some problems she was having. And Butler was a great occultist. Uh, so if you, uh, if you, you will run across them in some of your things. Uh, they definitely carried on some of the higher aspects of the Western mystery. Neo-paganism became very important. The Gardnerian Wicca, which was a, a, an attempt to create and actually revitalize uh, ancient folk traditions that were known to their enemies as witchcraft, but they were not you know, really used to do negative things to people, uh, were developed. Uh, Druidism, Druid schools, Druid uh, lodges developed in England, attempts to revive those. Uh, there were uh, uh, develop that Wicca is a very important force. It's a way that a lot of people do a kind of very simple form of you do your own shamanism thing, and they are getting in touch with nature and the elements and so on. 
Zoroastrianism or Mazdaism was, was very much revived, although a lot of the traditions have been lost. And uh, that's, that's something that revived very much in, the, in that century. And uh, so uh, the, the greatest keepers of uh, Zoroastrian tradition are probably the, the Farsis or Parsis. Uh, who are now persecuted to groups in their best uh, communities, I think, around the United States and Los Angeles and places like that. After Vivekananda, um, uh, Hindu Vedanta was established almost like Christian science. There were Vedanta reading houses and all kinds of things around the, the country. The idea of the, that, that we were coming out of the age of Kali into a new age became very established and became kind of a, a very important uh, idea, the age of Aquarius and all this sort of thing. Uh, it's really not based in any real deep Vedic stuff, but it's, uh, it was uh, a way of being very optimistic about human future. <laughs> uh, Yogananda, after he died, his body did not decay for, I, mean, I think they had his body visible for 25 or 30 days and there was no decay in his body and he was considered to be a great teacher, brought a lot of things to this country. So he probably was the second greatest teacher of Vedanta after Vivekananda. And then there are people that he trained. Um, this lady, uh, who was known as the mother, Mira Alfasa, was a student of uh, Rabbi Theon and a contemporary of Blavatsky and she trained in Kabbalah with Rabbi Theon who I talked about in the last session and eventually she went to India and she met this uh, this man who was a uh, was a rebel he was a revolutionary he was in jail for trying to kick the British out and in jail he went through deep deep philosophical transformation and, and so on and he became known as Sri Aurobindo He's now uh, literally a, an Indian cultural hero and honored by the government. And uh, there is even a place called Oroville, uh, which is an international city in India that has its own passports. And uh, it's a very interesting thing to learn about. Uh, after he died, he's, he wrote many, many, many books that interpret uh, Hindu philosophy and the Vedic philosophy to people and it's probably some of the most profound stuff you can get in English. Uh, the mother was the leader of that group. In my school, when I was running a school for gifted kids, I had uh, two people, uh, Rob and Kirti Hemsel, who were original members of this group with, uh, uh, with the mother and uh, were involved in the founding of Oroville. Their main uh, Ashram is uh, in Pondicherry, and we get a lot of our uh, best oils from their ashram, uh, the oils of the mother. So she went through all the different kinds of fragrant plants and so on, and did spiritual readings on them all, and can tell you much more. And a lot of the information I learned about it, I learned from her, others from myself, and other sources. And. Um, she uh, got very involved in a very advanced form of spirituality about the transformation of the human cells that uh, happened in the late uh, 70s and 80s. Uh, and if you ever get uh, to read The Mother's Agenda and some of these kind of literature that came out from that, you'll find some very profound stuff that is stuff that I had already come to myself independently and that she writes about uh, and is interviewed a lot. It's mostly in the form of interviews her students taking down what she says. Manly P. Hall was uh, a great occultist who investigated uh, all kinds of things, wrote wonderful books, founded, founded the Philosophical Research Society. I had the, the honor of spending a whole day with him in his secret vault with his uh, alchemical documents translating the Coptic ones for him. Uh, he had elephantiasis, so his limbs were very thick. He married Marie Hall, uh, uh, who had uh, a passion searching for documents that would have come to America from the master, uh, 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 the, the English
Swedish master who, who we talked about before, and I told you was a remarkable person, uh, who was responsible really for the exploration and the sending of English companies to America and for the translation of the King James Bible and a whole lot of other stuff. Anybody know who that was? Here's a test. You should know this master. Jesus. Pardon? Roger Bacon. It's, yeah. Sir Francis Bacon. Uh, considered by every English schoolboy until very recently to be uh, a, 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 an evil man who had uh, uh, yeah, bankrupted the country and things. That's not true at all. He took the rap for King James. But uh, she thought, she felt that he had a lot of very important documents that were buried in America uh, under a church in Williamstown. And uh, uh, that's owned by the uh, Rockefellers. They also own the Shakespeare, the Stratford on Amos, the whole thing. And the whole Shakespeare thing has been has been kept, uh, even though there's so much evidence now that uh, that Bacon was the author of many of the Shakespearean, the great Shakespearean things, uh, and the creator of the language and all this sort of thing. Uh, there's been a, quite a an attempt on the part of the Rockefeller Foundation and so on to keep people from investigating those things. And she was constantly stymied by them. She got permission from the government, from the foundation to do things, and then when she was going to go and dig, it had already been dug up and things like that. It's very interesting stories, and that's another story. Uh, Nicholas and Helena Rorick, a great theosophists and a great painter. Uh, and their son, George Rourke, became one of the great uh, Tibetan scholars and has written some of the most important works on Kalashakra and other things. Uh, these are some of the paintings of Rorik, and uh, they're considered to be very important by many people in the occult world because they have so much uh, that lays behind them. Here's, uh, these are all paintings of his you can just order as postcards from the Rorik Museum in uh, New York, and there are many others. They, uh, they developed a thing called Agni Yoga, fire yoga. And they also, he also created a symbol called the Banner of Peace, which I have up here in this particular painting I've done as a, as a stained glass window. Uh, this, this symbol of these three dots in a circle is found all over in rock formations in Tibet and other places. It's a very ancient Vedic symbol. And he established it as the banner of peace, and that that was uh, the symbol for his agreement, international agreement, not to bomb museums and, and plate collections of paintings and things like that during World War II, and that really resulted in the saving of those things. Uh, Agni Yoga books, uh, you should get them and read them. We have them <coughs> online uh, in the first order, in the first empowerment, and you can get them that way, uh, or you can buy them. Uh, they're not uh, essays, they are uh, utterances, <laughs> kind of like Heraclitus. Uh, they're dark utterances that uh, you have to read three times over many different periods. I read them all over about three years, three times, and, and really learned them and understood them, what they were about, in order to understand them. Um, so the Rorics were very, very important uh, in the earlier part of the century. Peter Dwinoff, or the master Bainsa Duomo, was uh, uh, active in the latter part of the 19th and the early part of the 20th century. He passed away during World War II. He was uh, such a great master in Bulgaria that uh, most of the people in Bulgaria were followers of him rather than the Bulgarian Orthodox Church. And so, of course, he was excommunicated from the church and called a heretic and everything else. And they would come up to his home, this beautiful place up in the, on the mountains, and they would learn spiritual exercises and the spiritual forms of dancing and mo movement and ways of meditation, and he would give them spiritual teachings and so on. He was also a violinist. And uh, he was a great master, and uh, it's 
kind of difficult to get a hold of material from him, though I do have those materials, and in England they still maintain them. Uh, but he was uh, a great Rosicrucian master, the really uh, in the same sort of mold as uh, Bishop Seradarian. His student was Omram Mikhail Ivanhoff. Uh, and this is him. He looks actually sort of like <laughs> Enzo Duomo. And uh, yeah, he also played violin, by the way, quite well. And uh, he died in the 80s uh, and wrote many wonderful books that are translated into English that I often recommend to people. Um, I, if you, uh, you, I recommend that if you ever see any of his books, you might buy one and read it. You made us read one of his books in THG. Did I? Yeah. It's great. Okay. Well, you all know about Edgar Cayce and the Association for Research and Enlightenment. Edgar Cayce was the sleeping prophet who went to sleep and then voices, a voice would speak through him and give people prescriptions for medicine and tell them where they could find buried oil and tell them about how California was going to fall off the rest of the world and all those kinds of things. But actually, he had a lot of very good, uh, very powerful prophecies and things like that, although they never really benefited him very much. When he tried to follow his own things and excavate for oil and things, he had met with serious failures. But he's, the, the, the ARA still exists in Virginia, and uh, they have all of his books and lots of other kinds of things. But he was a very important force in the, the middle and, and later uh, century. Torquem Seradarian uh, was a very revered friend of mine. Uh, this is his daughter Gita, who carries on uh, his legacy. And she's given me all of his books, which I have in my library now. I used to just buy them. And she's uh, also uh, an ordained independent priest. And she actually works through the, in, through the uh, Independent Church of Antioch. Uh, and she uh, is a remarkable woman who does a lot of remarkable work. Uh, I probably shouldn't be telling you about this. I should probably be having Tofa tell you about this. But Sufism came to uh, Europe. Uh, one of one of the earliest uh, big influence was Idris Shah in England, uh, who brought the ideas of Sufism with him, and uh, Gurdjieff in continental Europe. And in the U.S., Inayat Khan, who's uh, a musician and, uh, uh, and, and Murshid of the, uh, I believe, of the Kisti School and things like that. <coughs> and um, San Francisco, Sufi San, Jewish man, who was, became converted to Sufism, became a Murshid, uh, his followers, many of them split from the son of Inayat Khan over the issue of the smoking pot. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so there got to be kind of a split in, in this country. And there are various Murshids, often they're university teachers. I, I met with one uh, several years ago who teaches literature in, in uh, New York University and so on. And my ex-wife and I, Tess, who would teach Arabic, often taught Arabic to a lot of Americans who were becoming Sufis and wanted to learn Arabic. And uh, so when we would go to a vicar, where the women were to sit separately from the men, uh, the men had all come over to her table and talked to her <laughs> because she was their Arabic teacher. My teacher also is in Rashida. Oh, really? Rashida. Ah. Rahiyan, and she's also in the university. That's Sufi <laughs> Sam leading people in, in sacred dancing and walks and different kinds of things that were done. Dances of universal peace. Hazrat Inayat Khan, uh, I have all of his books that I've been able to get in English, and I think uh, Tof has given me a, a, a file of all of his writings. I love him because he's a musician especially, but and he writes about the mystery of sound and, and music and mysticism and so on, and how it's worked with healing and all kinds of other things. And uh, we're going to actually hear a, a little bit of a lecture by a Pythagorean named Daskalos, which just means teacher who is a, 
uh, will tell us a little bit more about how vibration in music relates to the angels and things. Gurdjieff Uspensky in the fourth way, I don't know very much about, do you? <laughs> it was a big thing in Europe, <laughs> and it was a mostly metaphysical, philosophical kind of thing related to Sufism. Oh, well, yeah, Gurdjieff's books. In fact, I, in the in the harmonic and toning, I played the movie they made from that where he first saw it being done, yeah. And that's, I guess that's his major claim to fame is his meetings with remarkable men, a person who explored and, and met masters in different traditions. There's a center in Oregon that I, I used to live in the town. That had, yeah. At your Jeep center. Amwark, uh, Spencer Lewis founded the uh, Amwark, which is a Rosicrucian group and, a, and an Egyptian museum. And he had some of the great Egyptologists of his time were members of it. And so it's still there, the Egyptian museum. Uh, and he also managed to uh, get uh, initiated in some very advanced traditions like Martinism and Rosicrucianism and things like this. And then he made it available to the American public through... Uh, yeah, through mail order, which was considered to be absolutely heretical, but was really a brilliant stroke. And uh, his, uh, after he passed away, uh, he was succeeded by some people and eventually by a fellow who decided that the thing to do was to translate all the stuff into Spanish, because a lot of Hispanics were very interested in Rosicrucianism and reincarnation. And he spent a lot of their money doing that and uh, people, the old guard got really mad at him and kicked him out, the French people. And so he was kicked out for doing that. And yet, most of the members now are Hispanic. A huge number of Hispanic members of Amway. Spanish speaking members, and it's all in Spanish mm -hmm. stuff. So. I think they have, this, they have a center in Mexico. Oh, I'm sure they do, yeah. They go to San Jose. Yeah, San Jose is, is the big center. You should really go to it sometime. Um, Mount Shasta, Guy Ballard, whose mother was a, had a metaphysical bookstore and he was trained in a lot of these things. His mother died and he came from the West Coast uh, to a kind of, uh, after her death, to kind of, you know, get himself back together again. Came to Mount Shasta and had an experience. He met a master, uh, the master who, a master whom he called Saint Germain. And uh, so that began the I'm, the I Am movement. Uh, this is a painting that a, a woman did who was a, he used to draw crowds of uh, tens of thousands of people to listen to him speak. And he was on um, Mount Shasta speaking and a woman saw all this and she painted this and gave it to him. And I love the painting, so I keep it. Uh, the I Am material, all the Guy Ballard material, long after the deaths of uh, him and his wife, uh, was kind of taken over, although it still goes on in its own foundation, was taken over by uh, some people who have, what, they, what do they call it, the Summit Lighthouse. I do not recommend Elizabeth Clare Prophet. <laughs> She's a screwball and a nut. And they've taken a lot of property from people, and a lot of people, and done a lot of nasty things. And so and you'll find that she has this painting, but she changed the colors so that she could copyright it. I was fortunate enough to find an, an original painting in the backyard sale. It just came to me on the 4th of July when I was playing a gig in Aptos. And I bought it and I took it to the lady who was really one of the old guard that really knew Ballard and all these people. She lived up in Weed, California because she didn't want to live on the mountain because the energies are too powerful. And she had three books that have been written by her students from, from her lectures. And they're all called uh, step by step, we ascend on the path, or something like that. And she was wonderful. And she looked at the painting. She said, "Oh my God, you got one of the original ones before it was corrupted by these uh, other people." But anyway, this is uh, this is where all this Mount Shasta stuff came from. Uh, yeah, I have it back here. I can't remember it right now. Uh, Doctor Eugene Whitworth very close friend, a member of our board of directors and passed away a year or two ago uh, and uh, authored some things with me, uh, founded the Great Western Brotherhood, which was a mystery school based on a lot of Egyptian things. And uh, 
The Brotherhood still continues, even though he's passed away, but uh, mostly it's centered in Napa, California now. I'm still on their board of directors. And so is Ken, I guess. Uh, Anne-Marie Colton and her partner, Jonathan Morrow. Uh, I have a lot of respect for Anne-Marie Colton. She was a great, uh, she was a great psychic and not just a, a channeler. And they actually had quite a big building they built in Los Angeles and had quite a following. And if you can get a hold of any of Anne-Marie Colton's books, you will have something very good that I would strongly recommend. I'm only showing you through the 20th century that I like. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, here is uh, the Martinist mess. Martinism uh, gets uh, splitters into all kinds of groups. Instead of the initiation being one initiation, it's now three initiations, or maybe four, or maybe five different grades of Martinism. It's uh, because it gets taken over by a bunch of Freemasons who want to divide it into first, second, and third degree things and uh, exclude women and all that other stuff. So you now had lots of different uh, Martinist groups. Uh, the, the TMO, the Martinist organization associated with AMORC, does not accept other Martinist groups. And the other ones, the traditional Martinist order, the other Martinist orders don't accept these and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I was invited to be a keynote speaker, though, at the, at the AMORC uh, Martinist order uh, probably <coughs> 10 years ago. Uh, in an attempt to uh, try to show some unity between different groups, because I had a very small Martin story myself. <laughs> and uh, I was the one who initiated Alberto, and who st started the whole OMCC thing. And uh, uh, it was very interesting, because I was not a member of the group, they had to do their meeting at a, at a motel instead of in their sanctuary, because I couldn't come into their sanctuary. But they wanted me to speak to them, so I did about you know unity and breaking. And then the people who had invited me in a year later were all kicked out, and they went closed up again. But that's uh, the what I call the Martinist mess. There are all kinds of Martinist groups and organizations who with, have developed all kinds of ritual and all kinds of things. If you're going to be a full-time Martinist, you'd be doing nothing but ritual from morning to dawn, dawn to dawn to to uh, dusk. Uh, reciting psalms and doing this and all that kinds of wonderful making circles and things uh, but um, it's really kind of a lot to do but uh, you know San Martin as I said was uh, transmitted an initiation the initiation and he did it to people that he had prepared philosophically and metaphysically he was not interested in magic or theology he had in fact broken away from uh, Martinism and so on well, the Interna International College of Martinist Studies, uh, which was uh, in Barbados, uh, was established by a rather wealthy jeweler who was a Martinist and who traveled around the world quite a bit. And he got a hold of a lot of Martinist material and trans had it translated into English and made it available to people on a sort of mail order basis, and then got himself kicked out of all these Martinist orders and started to establish his own. So, the International College of Martinist Studies became the International College of Esoteric Studies, and, and it goes on and on like this. So, uh, this is it's very interesting though. There are the Martinism is established in South America and Central America, and a lot of the early European esoteric Rosicrucian and other traditions did find roots in South America and other places. So, I have uh, myself chartered a Fratris Lucas group in South America. I can't even. I understand the letter of emails I send me have to put through a translator, and they call me the Great Master Lewis, you know, cool. <laughs> that means Grand Master, <laughs> and uh, on all that sort of thing. But uh, so there is quite a lot of esoteric work, and that's why Alberto is a person I really kind of hand over to all that because he has all the connections with <coughs> South American people and so on. The Holy Order of Mans, I can't tell you too much about. Uh, uh, probably uh, Bishop Keach can tell you more, but Earl Blyton was the founder of the very esoteric group that after his death has survived in sort of kind of other groups like the Christ the Savior Brotherhood, the Gnostic Order of Christ, the Science of Man, and some of these others. And uh, in which he taught people a lot of esoteric things, alchemical and Rosicrucian things, and different kinds of things, and had <coughs> various forms of initiation. 
And uh, Bishop Keach is, is a high initiate in this particular order. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you want to learn about it, you can read this book, The Odyssey of the New Religion, The Holy Order of Man's From New Age Orthodoxy, From New Age to Orthodoxy by this fellow Lucas. At least it's somebody's written something about it. I don't know how true it all is, but it's probably just it's very negative. It's pretty negative. It's pretty negative. So maybe this is not the, the best. I don't know if there's anything else to read. Actually, if you're truly interested, the website that uh, is the uh, Gnostic Order of Christ has a great deal of detail on it. Genesis was in the Yeah, Jessica and Timothy. And that's the people that you're associated with. Um, <coughs> then there are channels. They're always funny looking fat old ladies. Um, and uh, they're always channeling Jesus and everybody else, you know. They channel. Uh, masters and the Archangel Michael and spacemen and whatever you name it, they're channeling it. Uh, don't trust this stuff because usually uh, channeling is a psychological process that uh, does not reach deeply into your real deep spiritual consciousness, uh, although you can come up with some really interesting things. But channeling became a very important thing in the 21st century. Latter, latter, 20th century, latter part of the 20th century. And so you will find all kinds of people channeling the masters. Now, let me make a distinction. Bishop Sardarian used to distinguish between channeling and what he called higher triad psychism. The higher triad is the heart chakra and above. And that that is a one, and, and Bishop and, and, and Sylvia, um, who was her last name, who was... Uh, uh, member of the, the Alcyon community, who was a great uh, English psychic, who was a friend of mine, used to talk about not being overshadowed, but by being, being overlighted. <laughs> and so there are people who bring through very high communication and energies. Uh, and then there are people that are bringing through much lower kinds of things. And they all they can all be very deceptive and sound very good, but but usually channeling is what I used to refer to this sort of thing. Higher triad uh, psychism is what we do used to refer to what Lovatsky brought through and things like that. <coughs> um, here's uh, here's uh, some people. Um, Archangel Michael, who said who claims he's everything from my triad to you know whatever. And makes all these beautiful implements. Uh, you know, used to have places all around Mount Shasta, different things. Gone to Tibet and tried to get himself declared to be a great teacher, and so on. He's from Oregon. There's Oregon people, you know. And um, and then there's Benjamin Cream. Benjamin Cream is a British guy who's been declaring the appearance of the Christ is coming, and he's based on the sort of Alice Bailey ideas. And it's imminent. The Christ is going to appear, and then the, all the international, all of, all the governments are going to get organized properly, and the New Age is going to come in. And he goes around, and he made it, makes specific dates. I think mean, his last his last prediction was for 1984 or something like that. It didn't happen. Uh, anyway, uh, so there's there's this kind of thing. there's basically what I call apocalyptic uh, psychic apocalypse. You know that goes on. That was a very big thing in the 20th. New Mystery Schools, I mentioned the Great Western Brotherhood, you know about the Temple of the Holy Grail, uh, and there are other mystery schools, some of them quite valid, some of them. Mother Jenny was my teacher. Uh, she was, uh, if you ever get a chance to read her story, which I wrote, it's her biography she dictated to me, uh, it's really worth reading if you want to read about the development of a true uh, real psychic who is a very spiritual, <coughs> theosophical person. Is she that was halo around my your teacher. Head real, or did you Photoshop that in? No, that was just the light reflecting from her white hair on the wall behind. Daskalos. Um, the uh, Kyriakos Markitis is a was a is a university teacher. 
uh, went back to his island of Cyprus to meet the Magus of Stravolus, who was <coughs> a very famous Pythagorean healer, and he wrote this book called the Magus of Stravolus, which became a bestseller. So he wrote another book, mm -hmm. and another book, and another book, and another book, and another book about this, and it was all very good stuff. Uh, the person who has succeeded the person known as the Magus of Stravolus was his closest teacher, his closest student, who we call Daskalos, which just means teacher. And uh, he used to call it a system for the research of truth. <coughs> but basically it's Pythagorean uh, tradition that has been kept alive in the Greek tradition. Probably the same kind of thing that the Knights Templar were exposed to. So? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come.
So I'm just going to say that uh, you you heard Kabbalah, you heard Pythagoreanism, you heard Christian interpretation of uh, Pythagorean ideas. Uh, uh, you heard uh, much in that. That is probably what the Knights Templar were hearing when they were initiated uh, by the Johannites uh, back in a thousand years ago. So did they have as much trouble understanding it as I did. Probably more. <laughs> <laughs> um, now there's been a, a in the 20th century a, a revival of uh, of alchemy and hermetic alchemy and hermet hermetism. Um, the philosophers of nature in France who carry on the traditions of Nicolas Flamel uh, are offering courses in plant alchemy and metal alchemy and things like this, and they have to move their school out of France because there gets to be too much heat on esoteric schools. And uh, so they reestablish the whole thing in the United States and, and re replicate all their libraries. Uh, however, um, they've now taken that down. Willa and I have those materials, and you can still access it, but they're not offering it in a public way. There are alchemical websites you can go to that I'm going to put up here uh, that are if you're interested in modern alchemy. Um, contemporary Kabbalistic meditation in Judaism is based a lot now on Eastern postures and ideas. These are from a school in Los Angeles that uh, develop uh, meditation postures based on uh, asanas and other kinds of forms in Hinduism. So this is this is material that was brought to me when I was teaching at University of California from a very large uh, Kabbalistic school, right when Kabbalah was starting to open up again to the public. Uh, the French Johannine Church, as opposed to Johannite Church, this is um, Olivier Montara, and I've helped some of these people translate their stuff. He's a French Gnostic. He's been kind of persecuted by the government and not allowed to speak in public and things. It's amazing in Europe they don't have the religious freedom to do here. If you're not the Catholic Church, you're not a mainstream Protestant denomination, you haven't got any rights like we do. We'd have these rights in America. We would not have them in Europe. Uh, so and what happened if you have uh, something that, like, that, like that in Europe? What do they do? Well, in his case, they don't let him have a license to have a public meeting or to rent a building to have things and this sort of thing. He publishes books and things. It's a very different kind of thing than it is in America. So anyway, I happen to like this guy, and I like their people, and I like their ideas, and they're bringing through some. He's kind of, you might say, a successor to Mikhail Omram Ivanov in that same Rosicrucian tradition. My favorite, though, <laughs> is the lady that I brought, I, I ordained to the uh, episcopate, Barbara Marks Hubbard. She's uh, the heir to the Mattel Toy Company, and she spent her life trying to uh, deal with the problems that humanity faces in the 21st century, uh, including hunger. She's done a lot of work on hunger and things like that, and she now has her ministry is all together about helping humanity to uh, become responsible for the technology that's produced and their massive weapons and all that other kind of stuff and uh, to what the consequences of all that are. When I knew her, she was a vice presidential candidate in the Democratic Convention in, in San Francisco, and she had a lot of groups all around the country. And I met her because uh, Bishop Warren Waters was crazy about her. He loved her interpretation of the Book of Revelations. And uh, I uh, had just at that time done my first in, uh, translation of the teachings of Jesus, of, the, of what I call the, the New Gospel, that was in 86, and uh, uh, she had a, a small group that was a private group <coughs> that met privately in, and they got sort of guided privately, and uh, Bishop Waters had told me, well, you need to send your thing to and have her read it because she was really great, so I had, she, he'd give me an address and I'd put this in the mail. And she got a big message at this meeting saying, well, this great master is going to send you this, uh, these teachings and that you have to go with him and you have to do this stuff. And I thought, 
Well, the next day, my book arrived. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Great master. Uh, one of the bishops that was well, part of a group was Bishop Bob Love, who has died since. He used to be a Baptist fundamentalist, and he sort of went up until he finally got to the Barbara Marks Hubbard level. level. But I worked with her. I did a, a national con conference with her, but I wouldn't take her as a student at that time. Instead, I turned her over to uh, Bishop Waters, and he, he ordained her as a priest. And then uh, Spruit uh, was trying to keep her under his thumb and uh, do a bunch of things, so I clandestinely raised her to the Episcopate because she was ready for it. This is before I had any training. This is in the 80s. And uh, uh, she, I've been in contact with her ever since, and she's gone through some very good periods and some very down periods, and she's now got doing some really wonderful work right now. So uh, I'm going to tell you more about her later. So these are the things that I'm emphasizing <coughs> from the 20th century that I think were, uh, that are continuations of the Western mystery tradition, and certainly what Barbara has done is a, is a, is a, uh, uh, takes off from a lot of this other stuff and, and has its consequences in the Western mystery tradition.